1. I was 18, living in college dorms several hours from home, and working as a waitress at an upscale bar and restaurant. I'm short, barely 5 feet, so I'm used to people being creepy and trying to intimidate me now. But as an 18-year-old whose father had tried to protect her from the world, and had been raised in a tiny, friendly town, it never occurred to me to be scared of the people who lurk in the dark. We had plenty of regulars, several of whom I became close with during my years working there, and a few of the frequent diners learned my name and general facts about me, since I'm generally pretty open about who I am. One such man was tall, lanky, and several decades older, appearing to be in his mid-fifties, Joe. Joe was kind, a good man with a generous nature who owned a local shoe shop. The second time I was his waitress, he gifted me a pair of slightly worn work shoes, insisted that I accept them. Because of his kindness and the way he carried himself, people of all types flocked to him, and one of them became the first man outside of my family that I feared. Joe came in with his younger brother, about the same height, slightly bulkier build, and not unattractive as I recall, but his eyes unsettled me. In high school, I fancied myself as a bit of a writer, but nothing in my vocabulary then or now could help me describe how unsettling his gaze was. It seemed dead, lifeless, but I assumed I was simply nervous. Joe was a good man. His brother was probably just less carefree, more intense. The two dined together a few times in the coming weeks, but while Joe would normally request me as a server, he asked our host to assign one of the other servers to his table after the first time. Then one night Joe's brother came in alone and requested me by name, and I was happy to oblige. For the first time he seemed relaxed, energetic, charismatic. He was interesting with a quick wit, and a story for every topic I could throw at him. By the end of my shift I assumed he just had a hard time relaxing with his brother, and that may have been true. But through the laughter and charisma, his eyes never once seemed kind. They remained, through it all, lifeless. Eventually, it was time for me to leave, but he was still there, still expecting service. My manager offered to take over the table. He'd make sure I got the tip. But it was common knowledge I had an early morning class and likely had to do my homework. I jumped at the chance, but went to finish some closing duties and ask the man, my last table, if he needed anything else. He seemed... off. As soon as I said I was heading home, he seemed to harden. His voice was clipped and reminded me of my controlling ex-stepdad, which immediately put me on edge. I'd heard the same tone often enough as a little girl right before being hit. I left immediately. I called my best friend and offered to buy him dinner if he'd meet me at the diner between the dorms and my work. I don't know why I did. I just felt that I needed someone to meet me sooner rather than later. Joe's brother hadn't in any way seemed dangerous outside of the terseness in his voice before I left, but I knew that for most of my walk, which would have been poorly lit, I would be safer with a companion. We met at the diner, we ate and laughed, and headed back to the dorms, a good 25 minute walk, but only 15 or so in, the hairs on the back of my neck seemed to burn. Something was terrifying me, and I didn't know why. I told my friend, who brushed it off until he looked behind me and yelled. I turned and saw him, Joe's brother, only a few yards behind us, holding a metal bar. I don't know what they're called, but you see them at construction sites, usually for reinforcement when pouring concrete. And he was holding it hard enough that his knuckles were white. It terrified me to my core, and I screamed. My friend grabbed my arm and we ran, and even though my heart was in my throat and I couldn't hear anything past the blood roaring in my ears, I swear I could hear his footsteps behind us. We ran to the dorms and I told security, who had his wait in the office while he looked at the cameras in the lot and called the police. Cops showed, but did nothing since all he did was scare us. After they left, the security man asked a few more questions and made a comment about a man standing at the entrance door for a bit, before walking away. It was assumed he was homeless, but my blood ran cold. I called in for a few days, and when I went back to work, Joe was in. I told him what happened, and he nodded. Didn't even seem to question the validity of what I said. His brother, it turned out, had done some time for stalking and sometimes attacking young women. 
and had been sent to trial for assaulting one and hospitalizing her. Somehow he managed to avoid jail time for the assault, but Joe said it was only a matter of time before he killed someone. I didn't see Joe often after that, and I never saw his brother after that. The owner of the restaurant was angry for a long time, accusing me of running off a regular who spent a lot of money when he came in. It took a few more scary encounters to make me a little more cynical. But to Joe's brother, let's not meet. 2. I want to start by saying I'm a stay-at-home mom. A very stay-at-home, loner mom. And with my family so far away, it doesn't feel right to have them worry. I just want to tell my story. Whether someone hears it or not doesn't really matter. I'm not a writer by any means, these are just my thoughts and a recap of my night. Tonight I tucked my oldest kid into bed, and on my way out to my new nightly ritual of feeding my neighbor's cat, my husband made a joke about wanting corn dogs from 7-Eleven. I don't get out much, and don't mind, so I said we needed milk anyways and went on my way. The neighbor's was uneventful. Except their one hell cat hooked her nail into my middle finger when I was giving her treats. Because of this, I left earlier than usual and headed straight to the store. It's just after 9pm and I pull up to the 7-Eleven, parking alongside of the building, unobstructed windows spanning the entire length of the building. It's well lit. I immediately notice a gentleman in blue standing upon the sidewalk. I pay no mind, but start gathering my things. My finger still really hurts, so I'm taking my time and cursing that gorgeous cat when I hear a man's voice mumble something. My window is partially open, but my windshield is already fogging up, and when I look up, I see he is walking towards my passenger side. He starts trying to open the door, but thank god my kids broke that door handle and it won't open. I immediately step out of my car, and with me standing in my open door, looking out across the windshield, I say, Excuse me, what are you doing? And he starts saying over and over, You a yellow cab? Are you a yellow cab? I say again, I don't know you, I am not letting you in my car. He realizes he can't get in, and people are watching, so he starts walking away from my car, and I run inside. I'm a little shaken, but I try to sum it up to mistaken identity. We live in a small town, and our cabs are just random cars. I'm walking around and trying to make sure he isn't near my car, and at one point, I see him looking like he's walking away. I call my husband and I tell him a little bit of what happened, just to hear him say is probably nothing. Corn dogs in hand, I walk out and head towards my car, visions of this guy in my back seat flashing through my head. I see him walking away from my car, but now he has a backpack. Something flashes on the side of the pack and it hits me. I didn't lock my doors when I ran inside. This POS mother lover has my five-year-old son's backpack. I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but I walked maybe two feet from my car and I yelled, That's my son's backpack! I thought he might bolt, but started walking back towards me instead. I said again, That is my son's backpack. And he starts saying, Are you a yellow cab? Are you a yellow cab? Are you a yellow cab? I yell louder, That's my son's backpack! Give me that backpack! For a millisecond, I even consider the fact that this might not be my son's backpack and I panic, but I'm convinced the moment I see the bus pass. This man is still going on about yellow cab, and I looked at him, furious. Mama Bear is pissed. I take an extra long look at what he was wearing, hospital blue pajama pants, and a deep but vibrant blue hoodie with a W.O.T. logo, and the O has some hemisphere lines or something on it. All of this happens in a few seconds, and I just remember looking at him, pissed and telling him that he's effed for stealing a little kid's backpack and to get the F out of here. Maybe it's because I live in Canada, or maybe it was because I didn't leave the area where I could be seen, but he started walking away. I went inside immediately and told the clerks, but I don't think any of us knew what to do. For a second, I wasn't going to call the cops, it's just a backpack. But I couldn't help but think about him trying to get into my car with me in it. I called the police. I started telling them what was happening, and then I saw the guy again. I followed him while on the phone, and I parked way ahead of him. Time passes quickly when you're on the phone with the cops, and the guy passes my car. He turns back and sees it's me, and he turns around. 
I haven't turned off my car, so I panic, but I shift into drive and start driving away. This man wasn't scared. He was actually walking back to my car. As I'm driving away, I tell the officer, What the F was I thinking? This is so dangerous. I gave you his description and general location. I'm going home. We finished the conversation on the way, and I gave them my info and the guys. I don't know why I followed him. I follow a lot of true crime, and I guess I couldn't not report a man trying to get into my car. I told the police the same. We got off the phone, and I went inside. My husband is good at pointing out people's hardships, and it is clear this man had mental health issues, and I suspect some addiction issues. He was rather thin with large scabs on his face. He kind of dumbed down how I feel about it, and I think that's why I wanted to write this. What happened? It scared me. I don't know why I did what I did. All of it seems stupid. I approached the guy. I drove after him. God, I'm ridiculously slow sometimes. I did get the backpack back, but stupid. I received a phone call five minutes before I started writing this, and the police got him. He's going to the station for the night because he is extremely intoxicated. The officer's words. We pulled up with our lights on and he asked if we were a yellow cab. Part of me feels like maybe he's just drunk or something, but a part of me thinks he was using that as an excuse to why he would be thinking to get in my car. Definitely had an adrenaline rush and now I'm just tired. Thanks for listening. It was a weird night. Three. My friends always tell me I have an unusual knack for attracting weirdos, and this is always the first story that gets brought up when we talk about it. So I thought I'd share my experience with this guy from when I was back in secondary school. I'm in my final year of university now, and this guy still haunts me sometimes. When I was in secondary school, around six years ago now, I was friends with a group that constantly added more and more people into it. It was a good way to get to know more people from other schools, and generally, these people were quite nice and never invited creeps. One day, a new guy started to turn up and hang out with our group. For the sake of the story, I'll call him John. John was two years older than me, and when I first met him, I thought he was a little weird, but everyone in our group got on with him. He was good friends with someone who went to my school, so I didn't think on it too much, and just tried to get to know him. He told me about where he lived, what he was studying at college, and a little bit about his family and interests. I probed him a little further. This is where things began to get a bit strange, bearing in mind I had just met him that day. He began to get all excited and told me about how his father was a vampire, and his mum was impregnated by him. Using that exact word, which unsettled me, he said, jokingly, but looking back on it, it's a tad frightening, that I should be worried about him because he's half vampire, and he'd be coming for me in the night, and then kicked over a metal bin. Safe to say, I thought he was a downright weirdo, but I didn't go out of my way to be mean to him or ignore him. He seemed nice enough, and friendly, and he never presented himself as anything but an ordinary guy. My best friend Macy was really flirtatious in her personality, and John took to her really quickly after he met her. We used to go on walks, and if we found interesting abandoned places, we'd play Manhunt or something. And every time we did this, he would actively try to find Macy instead of anyone else. She hated this because she was already dating someone, and knew that he was trying to get her attention, and so she flat out told him that she wasn't interested in him. He soon stopped even talking to her. I guess out of pity I began to be kinder to him. I saw that the tides were turning in our friendship group and people were beginning to talk badly of him, because Macy was really popular and well-liked in the group. And even though she hadn't told anyone to act differently, the fact that he'd unnerved and upset her set people against him. So, actively, I tried to be nicer to him. I knew what it felt like to be outcast, and I wanted him not to feel left out. This was something I would come to regret. We began talking most nights, and we would video chat every other night because he said he was feeling lonely, or he just wanted to see my cute little face. I never thought too much of his comments because I just thought they were compliments. At the time, I never really thought too much on the things guys said about me or to me as I was busy studying for my GCSEs, and those were constantly on my mind. 
He would offer to help me study, even though he knew nothing on the things I was studying. I thought it was sweet, but I always studied better alone, so I always said no. He would insist, but I'd again say no. Soon things escalated, and he started turning up outside my school to try and see me. When I would get upset, he'd pass it off as he was actually there to see someone else, but he'd always open with he was there for me. Some of my school friends began getting involved. They'd say that they were concerned and that he seemed like a creeper, and he was too old to be hanging around our school gates. Even our head teacher came out once and lambasted him for loitering around the school's property. It was so humiliating. However, things really came to a head around April. It was my 16th birthday. He was 18, soon to be 19, by the way, and I was at home getting ready to go out and meet my friends to go to the cinema. My dad was at work and my mom was out doing the shopping, and it was just me in the house when there was a knock on the door. I knew it couldn't have been my parents because they both had keys and my brothers were still at school, so I presumed it was going to be my friends and their parents come to pick me up and take me to the cinema. So imagine my surprise when I opened the door and John was stood there with a present tucked under his arm. He greeted me happily and pushed the gift into my hands and said it was my birthday gift. I was really confused as I hadn't told him it was my birthday, and what's more, I'd never given him my address. While I assumed at the time one of my friends had given him my address, it later came out that no one had actually given him my address. He didn't say much else and then walked off hands in pockets, and I shut and locked the door. The messaging and calling continued. It worsened when he began texting me. Once again, I had never given him my phone number and no one admitted to giving it to him. One of my school friends joked that he was stalking me and maybe she should have bought me a knife for my birthday. We laughed it off, but looking back on it, I don't think it was genuine laughter. After a few more incidents here and there, I stopped talking to him. He messaged constantly, but I never replied and one day he just stopped messaging me altogether. I was relieved and I was able to continue with my life and studies, and I vaguely fell back into my normal routine with no worry he'd just turn up. I had a friend, Katie, who had only joined the group about a month before. She was 13 and went to a local school. She was really lovely and she was one of my closest friends, even though I'd only known her a month. One day she confided with me that John had now begun harassing her, that he messaged her constantly. He surprised her with unannounced visits to her house in the early morning. She had never given him her address. And she confided in me that he had tried to assault her in his house after giving her alcohol. I was horrified and felt my blood run cold. But like me, she grew up in a very strict household and her mum was a strict Orthodox Christian. And she feared her mum wouldn't believe her. So we kept it to ourselves. She had a boyfriend, and she couldn't even tell him fearing that he would try and hurt John or do something that would get himself in trouble, so I never told anyone. All in all, it was a tough situation. John hated that she was friends with someone else, and though he turned his affections away from me, I still felt involved and tried hard to keep Katie away from him. One night in about October, our group decided to go camping. At this point, there was a consensus not to invite John to a thing we did, and he had slowly dissolved from our friend group. We were camping a few times out from ours in a field next to a Boy Scouts club, so we felt safe enough. It was a really cold night, and we didn't have enough blankets, so me, Katie, and two other people shared a tent and huddled together to keep warm when we went to bed. At about 4 a.m., I woke up to go to the toilet. I could hear rustling outside and presumed it to be a fox or the wind and headed out to brave the gross weather. I sat down in the bushes to pee when I heard the unmistakable break of a branch and looked over to where I heard the noise from. It was John. He saw me and I saw him and I literally couldn't believe he was there. He looked like a serial killer half shrouded in the bushes and his eyes gleaming in the moonlight. After about five seconds of staring, he just walked in the other direction into the tree line. I stumbled back to the tent in shock and didn't breathe until the tent was fully zipped up again. I cried quietly for an hour before I fell asleep again. The next morning I asked if anyone had invited him, or if he even knew where he was. It was a closed group chat and none of us told anyone where we were going. 
meaning he had to have followed us from the train station to this area. Who knows how long he was there. People thought I was dreaming, but I wasn't. It was him as clear as day. And I will never ever forget the bored and plain look on his face as he turned and walked away. Like I didn't even see him. After this incident, he never messaged any of us again. I never even saw him again. He was like a ghost who existed in my life for nine or ten months. We spoke about him, and the fact that he was so weird, but we never ever invited him to hang again. Some of my friends at the time didn't even believe that any of this happened. Though me and Katie don't talk much, it's still something that she doesn't even like mentioning to this day. Even just his name being mentioned upsets her. I don't even know what happened to him, but... I'll call him my casual stalker. Because his stalking of me wasn't nearly as severe as Katie. She told me he'd just walk and follow behind her sometimes after the camping incident. But I never saw him again. So to my casual stalker, let's not meet again. Hey everybody, Hellfraser here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 470. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Well, for me, this is technically the weekend, and as I always like to do on the weekend, I will keep the outros a little bit shorter. Uh, one update I will give is regarding Dracula. I just want to let you know I've started recording it again. I've got Chapter 4 recorded. I don't know if I updated you guys on this. I'll do it again anyway if I haven't. Uh, so Chapter 4 is recorded, but I'm not uploading anything until I've got most of the book done. Because when I start uploading it, I want to make sure I can keep doing it week by week. Maybe twice a week if the you know, with the shorter chapters. Some of them are a bit shorter. Uh, but I'm about to move on to the part where uh, we, we introduce Mina. So I'm going to have to work on a Mina Murray voice, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, but uh, just so you know, I haven't forgotten about it. I am actively working on it, but it won't be up for quite some time, because that was actually my original intention, and I only started uploading it during a period where I was sick and I had nothing else to upload because I couldn't make anything else. Uh, so Dracula is coming, and uh, I'm just going to wait till most of it's done. Okay, and with that... I'm going to head off for now, so until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.